I don't know if you're aware that when Jesus was taken to the cross uh, in the last few days of his life, he only spoke seven times, seven short phrases, sometimes just a couple of words. <laughs> it's a way of saying farewell to the congregation that I've been part of uh, in, in role as pastor, obviously still around and still very much connected with friends and relationships, but also within the wider Christian community. You find this helpful, please share it with your friends. Believers or, or not, just I just believe that, you know, there's, there's some profound truths in these stories. It's interesting that these stories, thousands of years old, still have a profound impact on the way we live our lives. And I hope that you can get something from that. And the first of these, I'd like to just begin by reading a short extract from the Gospel of Luke, his account of the, of the Easter story. And it says this. So he's talking at the point in which Jesus is led out to be crucified. And it says, two other men, both criminals, were led out with him to be executed. When they claimed to, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they crucified him there, along with criminals, one on his left and one on his right. Jesus then said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And then they divided up his little clothes by casting lots. Now I'd like to just begin by asking a question, is, is how do you think we should respond when we feel we've been treated unfairly? What about when injustice or persecution happens to us? It happens to just about everybody at some point in their life, but when that happens, what should we do? How should we handle it? Well, I believe the most painful and most tragic, most profound example of betrayal and injustice beyond anything we can imagine occurred here in the life of Christ. <clears throat> For three years, Jesus lived with his closest friends. He took them, he'd taken them with him wherever he went. He taught them and he loved them, and he showed them how to live a life pleasing to God. For three years, he traveled around, and he also spoke to ordinary people. He taught them, he loved them, and he healed them. And the result of which is here, we see him being nailed to a cross, with nails through his hands and his feet. So they crucify him. And what does he do? How does he respond? Well, it's interesting, he responds by praying to his Father God and asking for their forgiveness. <clears throat> now, he could have been bitter, he could have been angry, but he didn't speak out against those who were treating him so badly. In the middle of his suffering, in the middle of his betrayal, he didn't even call out for justice, which he could have done. He just prayed for them, and he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Imagine going through this kind of physical suffering and in the middle of it praying for those who are inflicting it upon you and praying and asking God to sincerely forgive them. The question that must ask in all of our hearts is, why did he do that? How did he do that? Well, perhaps he prayed knowing in the full knowledge, knowing that in order for forgiveness, for, for someone to receive forgiveness, they have to be in a position to receive it. What I mean by that is in order to truly receive forgiveness, we all need to reach a point where we acknowledge our need of forgiveness. So the prayer that day that Jesus made from the cross was not that God should ignore their sin. Jesus asked God to forgive their sin. Now, this word translated forgive means to dispatch or to send away. So Jesus is saying that their sins should be forgiven, but that means <clears throat> that the sin obligation should be met elsewhere. You see, it's important to know that God cannot ignore wrongdoing. God just cannot excuse it. God can only forgive it. So the next time you feel let down or betrayed, the next time you feel stabbed in the back, this tells me that the first thing that you ought to do is pray for that person and pray sincerely that God forgives them. Now, I know that's a tough call, but the reason I tell you to do this is because this book clearly tells us that what we should do, and Jesus himself, in his words and deeds, shows us that's what we should do. A God who is really God cannot lower his standard of righteousness by not dealing with the things in our lives just because we're not aware of them. See, the ignorance of our wrongdoing does not give anyone an automatic claim on God's forgiveness, but it does bring everyone within the range of his mercy. So the next time you feel persecuted or ill-treated, try, try, my friends, and follow the example of Jesus on the cross and pray for that person's forgiveness.
and do it even if they don't understand or accept they've done anything wrong. Let me finish by telling you why I believe this is important. Because someone else, someone else somewhere is hopefully praying the same prayer for you. Somewhere else, in some other arena of your life, out of your ignorance, you may have profoundly hurt someone. And that person too might just be making the same type of appeal on your behalf. And thanks be to God for that. Everybody knows that now, most people know that Christians come to talk about the cross at Easter as a place they go to be forgiven, but also it is the place where we can go and learn how to forgive others. The words of Jesus as he hung on the cross saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, tells me that Jesus made no exceptions. He forgave everyone. We too must make no exceptions. We must forgive everyone. You must forgive everyone who has let you down. That is the single hardest practical truth of the Christian faith. I know that, but it's probably the single most practically profound truth of the Christian faith. There's nothing like this in any other philosophy. There's nothing even close to it in any other teachings or worldview. No matter what any person might have done to you, this tells me the best thing for them and the best thing for you is that you should forgive them. So that's the first of our seven little vignettes looking at the final words that Jesus spoke as he hung on the cross. Hello again. Good morning. Reading from John chapter 19, beginning at verse 23 to 27. When Jesus, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares one for each of them with the undergarments remaining. The garments were seamless, woven in one piece from bottom to the top. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's let the divide decide by lot who will get it. And this happened at the scriptures that might be fulfilled that said they divided my clothes amongst them and cast lots for my garments. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother's there, his mother there and the disciple whom he loved nearby, he said to her, Woman, this is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her home, the text tells us. So we see there are five people in total gathered at the foot of the cross. Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, Jesus' mother also called Mary, plus her sister, plus this one unnamed disciple. Now remember, I'm sure most of you know Jesus had 12 disciples, but after he was arrested, it appears all but one of them have fled. Interesting, isn't it, that it's the men who seem to have run away. Maybe perhaps they were worried that they might be next. They might be arrested, but it appears that it is the woman who have stayed. And Jesus speaks to them from the cross. And he makes a statement. It almost seems a declaration. And firstly, he says to his mother, woman, behold your son. You see, living in faith creates new relationships, new affiliations. It's almost like new family connections are being birthed here. You see, for these people standing at the cross, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of new things. The cross represents the beginnings of new relationships. Relationships that are so close, it seems that they can be described in terms of almost like a family. Did you notice, he also turns to John and he says to John, behold your mother. So the new relationship is reciprocal. It works two ways. Look at the text again, it said this. And he turns to the disciple and he says, Behold your mother. And then it tells us the extra information. From that time on, the disciple took her home. From that point on, John immediately took on the responsibility of caring for the mother of Jesus. Cross can also change your relationship with yourself, your understanding of yourself. These words of Jesus can completely change our understanding of ourselves. That's why... The Apostle Paul wrote elsewhere in a book of the Bible called 2 Corinthians, For if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. So think about that. Think about the different types of relationships that you might have. You have relationships that are produced by blood. We have fathers, we have mothers, we have brothers and sisters in the wider family. And we perhaps feel really separated from them at the moment because of circumstances. But there are other types of relationships. Some relationships are just based on shared interests, sports, hobbies, 
or maybe even for profit if we go into business relationships by people. But the important thing here, I believe Jesus speaks out, is that relationships produced by living out a life under the teaching and words of Christ are relationships formed with the purpose, the sole purpose of producing and replicating the love of God into other people's lives. Jesus told us, uh, said this very clearly when he was literally asked the question, what's the most important rule to live by in life? And his answer to that was love God and love your neighbor as yourself. There's no such thing as a significant human relationship that doesn't in some way contain two things, the ability to love someone else and the ability to forgive someone else. You see, these words of Jesus spoken from the cross of Calvary, the second of only seven phrases he said, I believe these words, if believed and understood and applied, have the ability to restore broken relationships. They can restore our relationship with God, they can restore our relationship with ourselves, and they can restore our relationships with other people if we but choose to apply them. The title of, uh, of the, the devotional is Forsaken. So we'll just take a moment and I'll read a couple of verses. This time it's going to be from Matthew's account of the, of, uh, of the, the Easter story. And I'm reading from Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 to 50. And it says this, From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sachbachthani which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When, when some of them standing heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran out and got a sponge and he filled it with vinegar and he put it on the staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. So when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So it's probably a reasonable question to ask of anyone at the moment is are you feeling somewhat forsaken at the moment but listen to the cry of our lord from the cross when he said eli eli lama saktani which translated means my god my god why hast thou forsaken me i think this word forsaken is one of the most powerful words in the english language it speaks to me of loneliness in the midst of personal catastrophe we may ourselves feel a little bit forsaken at the moment, perhaps alone, maybe out of the loop with our friends and our family, but perhaps the ultimate experience of being forsaken is what must be the, fe the feeling that one has been forsaken by God himself. If we think about, about this, uh, we think that Jesus has been at one with the will of his Father for 33 years. He's 33 years old and he's walked this, all, this earth. And during that time, he's enjoyed the love of God in all its fullness. But now it appears by this cry that he makes that God has forsaken him. He's lived a life where he's never been out of harmony with the Father's mind. He's never done an action or an activity which is out of step with the Father's will. He's never spent even a moment living outside of the love of God in his life and demonstrating it to others through his life, his words and his ministry. Then he reaches this point where the text tells us he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What must it be like to be in that place, to experience the, the, the sense of the very loss of the presence of God himself, the very loss of the presence of God's love? Jesus was completely on his own spiritually, emotionally at this point. Jesus was indeed forsaken by the Father that day, but that is not all that happened that day. A really important observation to note is he says, and it's really interesting, you've maybe not noticed this before, when he cries out, he cries out, my God, my God, not my Father. He doesn't cry out to his Father, he cries out, my God, and this is significant, very significant. I don't know if you're aware of the fact that the Gospel account of Jesus in those accounts, the, what are called the synoptic gospels, the eyewitness accounts of Matthew, Mark and Luke, he's seen to speak to his father 170 times. However, this is the only time he is seen to address God by the term God. All other times when he speaks to God, he speaks to him as his father, his father in heaven. But that's not what happens here, not on this occasion. 
This time he says, my God, my God, why has this forsaken me? So what is the reason for that change of use, that grammatical change? Why did he do it in that way? Well, I believe this is because at that moment, Jesus was hanging on the cross and he was a representative of huma hum humanity. He was a representative of you and of me. He's hanging there representing a fallen humanity a not perfected humanity, the human race in all its errors, in all its faults. He was not hanging there as the son before the father. And I believe that's really important. At that moment, Jesus is completely and fully a representative of humankind before the God of all creation, not a son before a father. But on that day, Christ was forsaken. He was forsaken by God and he was forsaken by God in our place because it was you and I who deserved to be forsaken by God. The key perhaps to understanding this is to recognize that Jesus did indeed take our place that day. He took our place standing before God representing corrupt human beings. His cry was made that day so that you and I would never face a day when we would have to cry out in that way ourselves. I don't believe any man or any woman has ever been so alone as Christ was that day. No one in human history has ever been forsaken in such a profound way. The message, I believe, is simple. Christ was forsaken by God so that you and I need not be. You see, I believe this teaches of the promises of the cross that no one will ever need to be forsaken by God in this life or the next. God will never, in any circumstance, forsake anyone who trusts in him. As it says in scripture, that nothing can separate us from the, God, the, the love of God in Christ. Let me repeat that. I'll say it, well, I've, probably R Paul, when writing to the Romans, says it more emphatically than I, I can ever say. He says this in a, in a book, a letter he wrote to the Christians in Rome. He said, who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ? That's the question. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or, so, or sword? The Apostle Paul asks the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Let's consider the possibilities. He says, shall trouble separate us? No. What about hardship? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Danger? Sword? The sword? No. Not even a pandemic? No. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. For I am convinced, he says, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor neither any height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Christ died so that you and I don't ever have to be alone. Christ died so that we don't ever have to be alone forsaken. But today I'm going to read to you from uh, Luke 23 and a few verses from 35 to 43. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. So Christ hanging on the cross at this point. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God, the Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're king of the Jews, save yourself. And there was a written notice placed above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself. But the other criminal rebuked, rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? He said, Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So there are three of them crucified very close together. There may be another crucified around, but these three are so close together, they're able to talk, communicate with one another. It's often pictured with an uh, imagery with Jesus in the middle and one cross on the left and one cross on the right. We don't really know if that was the case, but it seems likely. But the word criminal is used to describe these men, which is a very general terms. What we can say is that they were at least thieves and robbers. And the fact that they were being crucified means that they had used violent means to do, that, to do their deeds, shall we say. 
They could well have been a great deal more than this. Some have argued that they were would have, were were perhaps in what were called insurrectionists and were very likely to have been murderers. I think that's a reasonable point of view. But the point is they both committed repeated serious crimes that had led them to both be justly entitled to be executed under the Roman law of that time. They're hanging on the cross and they know they're going to die and they're going to die very soon. And it would appear that they'd heard about Jesus. They'd heard about, by their words, we know that they'd heard about, about who he was and they'd also clearly heard about his claim or the claim made on his behalf that he was the Messiah. One had certainly, the first one who spoke, had certainly heard the claim and his response to that and the knowledge of that is to hurl insults at Jesus. In, in fact, blasphemes him is the word that is used in other tr translations and, and the other gospel accounts. So even though this first criminal knows that he's supposed to be the Messiah, his individual response to that, you know, this is the Messiah who's supposed to come and free the people from the power of sin. But instead of receiving that information as Jesus is Messiah, he rejects him. But more than that, he, even in these last moments of his life, he chooses to insult him and blasphemes him, just like all the other people who are around standing nearby watching. So that's the response of criminal number one. His response is to reject Jesus and to mock him. But there's a second criminal, a second person beside Jesus on the, on the cross, and he has a second response, a very different response. What a stark and dramatic difference it is between the two men. One mocks Jesus, but the other, he just says, wait a minute. He speaks to the other guy and says, wait a minute, we've earned our right to be on the cross. We've been punished justly and we're getting what we deserve. You see, this second man doesn't try and cover up his guilt. He confesses it. He doesn't make excuses. He doesn't try and excuse or write off his wrongdoings. He openly confesses his sin. You see, it appears to me that the second man recognizes two things. He recognizes he's guilty and he recognizes who Jesus is. And this is abundantly clear when you notice he says, he says this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So this second man, it appears to me, completely recognizes who Jesus is and that the fact that he is savior. And by asking Jesus to remember him, when he comes into his kingdom, as he, he describes it, it clearly implies to me that he's trusting in Jesus for his eternal future. He's trusting in Jesus personally to get him to that place. I'd like to give you a quote from the Bible. See if you recognize it. For God so loved the world, and God loved all the people who are really nice, and all the people who do everything correctly, and he loves them because they're well behaved, and if they live a good life, they will earn a place in heaven. Do you recognize that verse? Well, I hope not, because that's not what the Bible says. What does the Bible really say about these matters? The actual correct scripture is, is for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The, these words of Jesus on the cross say the real way the only way is to say what criminal number two said and to say, Lord, please remember me. Remember me, Lord Jesus. Remember me because I believe you are Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus's reply to that man's cry that day was very straightforward. He said this, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross got offered something by Jesus much better, much, much better than he'd asked or even hoped for. He said to Jesus, remember me. He was trusting and hoping for something far off in the distance, something maybe in the future, into eternity. But Jesus says today, his reply to him is today you will be with me in paradise. And that's the point. You don't have to wait for hope. You don't have to wait for something that's a way off distance in the future. It can happen for you today. It can happen for all of us today. That's the one simple thing I wish you to know and to be encouraged by today, particularly at this time. Jesus's words from the cross said, today you can be with me in paradise. All you have to do is say, Lord, remember me. I remember what you said and what you did on the cross. 
Remember me, Lord, because I remember you and what you did. That's it. Trust in these words of Jesus, these final words of Jesus spoken from the, the cross, and trust in those alone. Amen. Welcome to this, uh, the fifth, the fifth in our seven-day devotional thinking, focusing on the final words of Jesus, uh, those words, the phrases spoken from the cross. Reading John 19, verses 28 and 29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished and that the scripture might fulfilled, be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with wine, put it on hyssop, and put it in his mouth. And that was a reminder I said the other day. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was fully human and fully God. But you may remember just the other day I pointed out that at this moment in time with Christ hanging on the cross, he is hanging there wholly as a representative of humanity. He's hanging as a man before God. He's not there as the Son before the Father. So in this occasion, in his humanity, he is expressing his physical suffering, his human weakness, when he cries out, I thirst. This cry of anguish from the cross tells us that Jesus' life on earth, although it is seen to be sinless, it certainly was not painless. He suffered physically just as much as you or I might suffer if our bodies had gone through that same experience he had the previous day. He had been betrayed by his friends. Remember Judas? Everybody remembers that betrayal. But what also about Peter? Peter was one of his very closest friends and Peter had denied him. Not once, not twice, but three times. There is nothing that you or I have experienced in life that Jesus Christ himself is not seen to experience in the gospel accounts as well. He literally knows how you and I feel in every respect. Here's the big point, friends. Christ dying thirsty, it was so that you and I could go drink from the water of living truth and never thirst again. You know, he understands what you're going through right now. It's a really tough thing to say, but sometimes in this life, it is the suffering that makes us stronger. It can even make us better, better than who we were before. We have to be realistic. Not all things in life are good. Some things come along that are really tough to bear. And that is that Jesus really understands what you're going through and he wants to minister to us. He wants to minister to you, even if you're in the middle of them. We can hang on. To the, to the scriptures which tell us this, and I'm quoting from Romans 8, 28. It says, we can know that all things God can work for the good for those who love him and have been called according to his purposes. Uh, it's been really good to join with you over the six days. We're getting to the, uh, to the, to the, the climax of this amazing story. And I'm going to just read a couple of verses from John's account again, just picking up with where we left off yesterday, beginning John 19, verses 28 to 30. Later, knowing ever, that everything had now been finished, and so scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. That's what we talked about yesterday. Then a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they spoke, soaked a sponge with it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And then says, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I don't know about you, but just think that if you think a man of 33 from Galilee hangs on a cross on a hill outside Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and he cries, finished. It is finished. Now for me personally, I hadn't really figured out who I was or what I was doing by the age of 33. Maybe that was the, the, the important point. Maybe that was the point where the most significant part of my life was about to begin. Yet here we have Jesus, age just 33, and he cries from the cross, it is finished. What, what do you think of the significance of these final words of Jesus were? I'll just read that final verse where he said, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. So when he said it's finished, the question you must ask, and I want to ask this morning, is what was finished? Maybe he was just saying that he'd finished with his suffering. Maybe for him at last the pain was over. 
You know, we have to remember that he'd been hanging on a cross for over six hours now. Throughout the early chapters of the account of the life of Jesus, the gospel writers all actually said at various points that Christ, that Jesus had come in order to do certain things. And they also said that at some point those things would be finished, they'd be accomplished. So is this the end of his ministry life that he's declaring that these are? Is that what words, is that what he means when he says it is finished? We can clearly see that his life is completed. We can see that his ministry, his service amongst human beings is completed, his physical ministry. And we can also see the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of his appearing and his life and ministry have also finished. They've also been completed. Is that what he means? Is it the fact that all these things are indeed now finished? But is there more to that? Is there any more to it than that? I believe there is, yes. Perhaps the most important thing, perhaps the main thing he meant when he said it is finished, is that he had completed, he had finished his sacrifice, completed his sacrifice for humanity. You see, friends, the most important prophecy regarding the Messiah is the one that said he would die for the sins of his people. The word finished that Jesus spoke that day is in fact the same word that was printed on Roman tax receipts as a record of a payment of tax having been made. The term that he used finished actually means paid in full. That's what this term finished means. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and with almost his very last dying words, he only says one more thing which we look at tomorrow, he said something had now been settled. It had been accounted for. And what I believe the, script, the Bible tells us is that what was settled that day was the price for corrupt human beings and their effects they have on the world had been paid and paid as full. In paying that price, he had indeed brought us back to God. So it is finished, he cried, paid in full. I believe that by these words from the cross, Jesus connects everyone with God. He connects you and he connects I with the God of eternity. And that's what the cross is about if you just but embrace it and apply it in your heart and in your life. So my conclusion this morning is this. Yes, he'd finished his suffering. Yes, he'd finished his ministry, his service on earth. Yes, he'd even finished the fulfillment of prophecies regarding the coming of the Messiah. But most importantly, He'd finished the sacrifice for sin. He'd sin finished and completed the penalty for the sacrifice for your sin and for my sin. One, just one word this morning, finished, amen. And uh, the scripture in the final series of seven scriptures of the words that Christ spoke out from the cross this morning comes from Luke chapter 23 from his account of, uh, of the, the death of Jesus. And just two verses 44 to 46 and this is listen closely friends because this is the last words that jesus spoke in his earthly ministry and it says beginning at verse 4 now it was about the sixth hour and there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour then the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was torn in two and when jesus has cried out with a loud voice he said father into your hands i commit my spirit and having said that, he breathed his last. Of the seven things that Jesus said as he hung on the cross, this is the very last thing he said before he died. And his final words on earth were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said that, he breathed his last. Now I want to remind you, because we covered this earlier, that this is the, he returns to his use of the term Father at this point, and we should are reminded that Jesus Christ is the son of god but i believe it also reminds us of something and that's in order to prepare in order to be ready for eternity to be ready for death in fact you need you also we also need to secure our inheritance as a child of god this is an issue every one of us is going to have to deal with one day now you may not be thinking about it now maybe perhaps a little bit more than you were last week but i promise you very suddenly at some point in the future this will become the most important thing in your life. When you trust yourself into God's hands, as Jesus did, when you trust yourself into God's hands through Jesus, 
the promises of heaven, yes, that's a gift and a gift you cannot lose. But I believe that understanding that aspect of your eternal future can not only truly prepare you for the end of things, but can tell you how you should live your life in the everyday. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit is not the cry of a dying victim. This is the cry of a victor. Just before, a few moments before we heard this, this utterance, we had heard him say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And we heard just a couple of days ago how he said, when he, uh, accepting his role as dying for our sins, he said, it is finished, that job is finished complete. But now he's speaking as the son who is at peace. And now he's saying, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. This is the point where the work of the son is done. And now he's ready to go home to be with his father in heaven. I would like to suggest that the death of Jesus should be our role model in how we live our lives. Jesus prayed and all, all his life he prayed prayerfully. Every moment of his life was prayerfully submitted to the will of his father God. And even on, in, in the, the dying moments, his last prayer on earth was a testimony to that also. Prayer was the language of Jesus's life. Almost every word that came out of his mouth was a conversation, a conversation surrendered to the will of his Father God. But should we not wait? Should we wait really to the last moments of our lives to do that and commit our souls to the care of our Father? Are there any areas of our life where we could be more willing to do that today? We more willing to be obedient and sub submissive, more willing to be service minded to one another, not just in our human relationships, could we be more submissive in our life to the will of God? The way to prepare for eternity is to live a life that is submitted, submissive as a child of God. If you live your life as a submissive child to God, obedience, obedient to his word and his spirit, when you do reach that time, when you leave this earth, you do not die in vain, you die in victory. You do not die a victim. My prayer is that every one of us on that final day, in our final moments, will be able to say, that you will be able to pray, that we will be able to pray just like Jesus and say, Father, in all things, into your arms, I commit my spirit. Bless you all. Thank you for joining me these seven days. And please continue to pray. For Paula and for myself and my daughter Hannah who is home with me at the moment and for son David who's isolating down in uh, uh, near Oxford. Thank you and God bless you all this Easter Sunday. Amen.